Welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. Today we're taking a closer look at the Canadian Centre for Experimental Radio Astronomy. If you saw my video about buying a surplus geodesic dome, you'll recognize this building. In case you missed that video, I recently got an 18-foot space dome from here, the same size as the smaller grey one at the lower right. NATO Satellite Ground Station F-8 was built in the small town of Carp, Ontario. This provided secure communications to the nearby government fallout shelter, known as the Diefenbunker. Intended to protect Canada's government and gold reserves during a nuclear war, the Diefenbunker and the nearby satellite station became obsolete in the 1990s. The bunker became a Cold War museum, and the satellite station was sold as government surplus. The building is currently occupied by a few different groups, including a company who maintains these geodesic domes for radar and satellite installations. Most interesting to me is the group using the big dome up top, along with the big dish antenna inside of it. The Canadian Centre for Experimental Radio Astronomy is a non-profit group supporting astronomy and astrophysics education and research. They began refurbishing the former NATO satellite dish in 2022 with the intent to modernize it and convert it into a radio telescope. I got the chance to meet some of the folks involved with this project, including the Centre's president, Marcus Leach. My name is uh, Marcus Leach. Uh, I currently run the Canadian Centre for Experimental Radio Astronomy. Uh, which is where we are. We're at our, our headquarters, if you will, uh, where we have a 12.8 meter dish uh, inside a radome, and uh, we are doing educational support, astrophysics programs, mostly at the undergraduate level, uh, and to do a bit of our own research, of course. The main thing is to provide astrophysics students with hands-on uh, experiences in, you know, being at a real radio observatory and doing actual hands-on uh, work. This dish isn't really big enough to be like a, what I call a discovery engine. They're not going to be doing any groundbreaking research, but having some hands-on experience with an actual instrument really helps. So we're at an ex-NATO facility. This was a NATO uh, satellite ground terminal uh, built in 1971 uh, and decommissioned in 1997 uh, and then purchased by a private enterprise in 1999. NATO had three sort of series of SATCOM projects. Yeah. This was part of SATCOM 2. So there are only two other intact SATCOM <coughs> two, two stations left okay. in the world. We have a kind of a long history in doing this kind of stuff. Uh, we had a previous project with an 18 meter dish, uh, which went, went nowhere after seven years. Uh, we had a, a facility near Smith Falls where I live uh, with a bunch of dishes on the roof. Uh, and we had a transition facility near Rideau Ferry uh, with a bunch of dishes and doing a bunch of interesting things. And we had a call out of the blue, basically, by the guy who, who runs this place, who owns the place, uh, and said, hey, you want to come, come and take a look? We did. Uh, we said, oh, yeah, yeah, we can use this. So we moved our operations to here about uh, just over 18 months ago, I think. It was not designed as a radio telescope. The radio gear is all different and we have to remove it and that's actually, a, a, when it's a 12.8 meter dish, that isn't trivial. You don't just get up on your stepladder and start pulling stuff off. Uh, so you have to be much more deliberate about what it is you're doing. The area's job we've done here so far was lowering this thing. <laughs> the motion control system totally doesn't work, the existing one. Uh, they, NATO left with most of it uh, when they left. Uh, so that's that's one of the biggest challenges. They are seven and a half horsepower DC, roughly 200 volts DC. So there were four of these per axis. It's all volunteers. Uh, funding is through a mix of personal donations uh, and also the uh, arrangements we have with our academic partners. Uh, <clears throat> they pay us a bit of money to keep the place going to support their students, uh, that sort of thing. But we're always looking for money, I have to be honest. You know, <laughs> we're always looking for money. One of the biggest repairs to the dish involves a spot inside the motor control cabin. This cramped space held the original DC motors for moving the dish, along with the brakes and a manual backup. Inside the yoke or frame around this cabin is a spot where water collected and began rusting out. Marcus and his team have been testing and evaluating the structural integrity of the metal. Fortunately, the entire thing is overbuilt to military standards, so there's no danger of failure. It's not thin galvanized steel like you'd expect even in commercial. It's like solid steel. Oh. This piece here probably weighs like 50 keys. 
However, they're still working to clean up the rusted areas and replace any thin sections of steel. Well, you've seen the uh, structural repair that we need to undertake. Um, we've been working on that both ourselves and we will be retaining other resources to complete that work. Um, that's, that's probably the, the most concerning thing uh, for us uh, was that structural thing. And then the remotorizing project is a big deal. Uh, mechanically, it's complicated uh, and requires you know, heavy equipment. Uh, you know, people who do their own robotics and stuff might recognize it, but not at the scale that we need to, uh, to, to, to run at. They've also replaced much of the original transmitter and receiver electronics with modern STR-based equipment. Marcus actually worked with Newelect to create some of their LNAs, so I've probably used some of the products he helped design. Ironically enough, the RF part of this is e relatively easy for, for me anyway. Uh, since I've been involved in ham radio since 1986 and electronics since 1973. So that part of it is relatively straightforward. And we even have equipment. It's like we're, we're not short of equipment in that space. But the mechanical systems are the, are the big thing. Working inside of a satellite dish offers some interesting challenges, such as cable management. The dish can rotate 360 degrees thanks to extra long coiled cables, but it can't continuously rotate without occasionally switching directions to unwind things. A tremendous excess of cables. Okay. And it goes, it starts on the outside of this almost literal clock spring mm -hmm. and winds its way inwards. Okay. And so what happens is that in one direction the cables are loosening up mm -hmm. and in the other direction they're tightening, but you okay. still have over 360 degrees. The big ones there aren't cables. They are actually cooling pipes. Oh, wow. So they ran a two-loop uh, um, high-pressure water cooling system uh, for the klystroms that were the transmitter here. Uh, on the blue blue and red pipes, Okay. those were the two water cooling loops for the klystroms that were in here. Blue is cold return and hot, and, and red is the, is the hot. I, don't, I think that might have been like a pressure relief valve or something. The CCERA is also adding safety measures to these enclosed spaces, which could be hazardous when the dish is moving. Some of the equipment cabins actually rotate or change shape during operation. Uh, this is our current uh, elevation uh, measurement. It's a uh, uh, gravitational sensor. Okay. Uh, we have two of them, so they're just clamped together and we average the, the reading between the two of them. Even though we weren't we didn't have full motion control last summer. We actually did a bunch of, of test observations to test the sanity of the system. So targets like 3C400 and M87 and a couple of different quasars and sort of all of the usual suspects uh, that you use for kind of testing the sanity of your, of your telescope, those were all reasonably successful. And then there was a months long project to support this observation that the student was making. Uh, of the recombination lines in M17. Going forward, obviously we're going to support the observing programs of our partners, of our academic partners, but also we have our own pet projects. Uh, I would like to do um, daily observations of a repeater FRB, a fast radio burst. It's, that would be easily doable here once we have tracking. Supermassive black hole mergers, uh, because there's radio output from that when that happens. So yeah, we, we do have some specific projects that are kind of just for us. The dish itself was originally a Cassegrain reflector, which I'm probably mispronouncing. This meant that signals bounced off the dish, then off a smaller reflector in front, and then back into the base of the dish. For astronomy use, the CCERA changed the dish to a prime focus type, with the receiver feed out in front. This gave them a wider beam width, and it should allow feeds for multiple frequencies to be used. Seeing this dish and the refurbishment project definitely matched a lot of my interests. As someone who takes old disused stuff and turns it into something new and useful, I found the whole project to be fascinating. I've only just started to dip my toes into this field of science, but Marcus and his team have really inspired me to learn more about radio astronomy. It is a thing you can do in your backyard. I think a lot of people have tended to think of it as you need you know, a 15 meter dish and millions of dollars worth of equipment but there are observations you can make in your backyard and with the, the low cost of electronics these days and receiver systems and all of that stuff, it's something that anybody can do if they have an interest uh, and, it, and you can just develop your skills over time. 
Uh, there is the uh, Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, radioastronomy.org, I think, uh, but they're easy to find. Uh, they support uh, amateur level radio astronomy. We do too. I mean, we're all we're all amateurs. I didn't I didn't work as an astrophysicist, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's actually a lot easier than you think. Huge thanks to the Canadian Centre for Experimental Radio Astronomy for letting us see their project and poke around inside their equipment. Thanks as well to CSS Building Incorporated for selling me a surplus geodesic dome, which will hopefully become a small radio observatory soon. I'd also like to thank Dan from Simple Electronics for providing some of this footage, and the Diefenbunker for letting me film in their museum. If you'd like to learn more about amateur radio astronomy, check out some of the links in the video description. You can also help support this project and the CCERA's other work at the GoFundMe link below. Make sure to subscribe for more content like this along with my usual DIY projects. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.